Best Book Bits presents Donald Robertson, author of six books, trainer and writer specializing in hypnosis, cognitive behavior therapy, and stoicism. Lecturing on stoicism for roughly 25 years, and he's one of the founding members of the Modern Stoicism Organization, a non-profit responsible for Stoic Week and Stoicon, the international conference. Donald, thanks for being on the show. Well, hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, no worries. Now, for those of my audience who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about your journey and sort of how you got here so far. Well, my background originally is in academic philosophy. I studied philosophy at Aberdeen University and then at Sheffield University, I studied in an interdisciplinary center for philosophy and psychotherapy. I became a counselor and psychotherapist. So for a long time, I've been integrating philosophy, particularly ancient philosophy, mainly stoic philosophy, and psychotherapy, mainly cognitive behavioural therapy. And I've written a bunch of books on the subject, and so that's kind of my niche, basically. It's mainly, I'm mainly known for stoic philosophy and how it relates to cognitive behavioural therapy. Yeah, perfect. And we'll, we'll deep dive into that a little bit in a, a second. And the accent, I think that you're from originally from Scotland, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, I'm, I haven't been there for a long time, but originally I come from Scotland. And uh, I'm now speaking, speaking to you from Athens. Uh, I'm right um, in uh, Academia Platanus, uh, which is the suburb where Plato's Academy, the original academy, was located. So I'm near the, the ruins of the, the park where that was located. And uh, I'm also a Canadian citizen, so I kind of live in Toronto and Athens. And what, what brings you to, uh, to Greece at the moment? What, what are you doing there? Well, I, I come to Greece to do research, like I was recently in Delphi, which is where the Delphic Oracle is located, at the Temple of Apollo, and um, so actually on Friday I'm going to Eleusina, which is where the Temple of Demeter is located and where the Eleusinian Mysteries, the main mystery religion, uh, was carried out in ancient Greece, just outside Athens. So I do a lot of research here on Greek philosophy uh, for the, the books that I'm working on. Yeah, perfect. And uh, I think your first first book was published back in two thousand nine. It was called "The Discovery of Hypnosis." What what was that all about? Um, that was an edited edition of the collected writings of James Braid. So hypnosis was discovered by a Scottish guy, and uh, I thought he deserved more credit for that. Um, so I, I was the first form of psychotherapy I was interested in was clinical hypnosis, and uh, I came to it from a background looking at the psychological research. The first book I read on it actually was by Hans Isink, he's a famous uh, psychologist in the UK. And uh, I, I thought it was a shame that nobody had really published Braid's writings. So I edited his collected writings. I reverse translated his last article, which was only available in French. It wasn't even available in English, so I, I, I published that. And uh, yeah, I used to practice evidence-based cognitive behavioral approaches to hypnosis. I taught it for many years. And uh, that kind of led on to writing and teaching more uh, different types of psychotherapy. And uh, also my other focus is on preventative psychological techniques, which we call resilience building. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, you've written uh, numerous books on it. So one, the the philosophy of cognitive behavior therapy, written, uh, published in 2010. And then on to the practice of cognitive behavior hypnotherapy as well. So uh, not only you're a writer, but you're actually uh, trained and, and, and well-versed in it, obviously studying, teaching, and writing for over 25 years. Um, what is cognitive behavior hypnotherapy for, for people like layman, people like myself that don't know what that may be? I'll tell you the very abbreviated version of that. So most people yeah. assume that hypnosis is got to do with inducing some kind of altered state of consciousness, like a trance state. Um, And there's an alternative theory, which is more based on scientific research, psychological research and hypnosis, which is that hypnosis is more about a bunch of more down to earth psychological factors like focused attention, heightened expectation, and other favorable attitudes and motivations. So the sort of stuff that we measure when we're doing psychological experiments. And all of those factors are closely related to concepts that we employ in cognitive behavioural psychotherapy as well. So it's a model of how hypnosis works that's based on research on hypnosis, huge volumes of research that exist on hypnosis, and it integrates more closely with another type of psychological therapy, which is CBT, the leading evidence-based form of modern psychotherapy. 
Yeah, got it. Yeah, and um, you've done a book as well regarding resilience and 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 building your resilience. Where, where did the sort of where did that come from? Well, prevention is better than cure, Michael, as everybody knows. And psychotherapies are kind of Johnny come lately in the scene. We only get to see clients when they've already got a problem, like or a diagnosis, even, and they so they come for treatment. And so, what would be even better is if that didn't happen in the first place, and nobody came for psychotherapy because everybody already uh, had the character traits and psychological skills that made them resilient or less vulnerable in the face of adversity. And stoicism is a kind of philosophical inspiration for cognitive therapy, but it focuses more on preventative resilience building. So toughening us up in a sense, to put it crudely, so that we were less vulnerable in the face of setbacks, trauma or misfortune. And uh, this is a kind of burgeoning, it's a a kind of new area. Um, It's in its infancy in terms of psychological research to some extent, but there are some, you know, an increasing number of large studies on techniques that can be used to build psychological resilience for the military and in school children, and people that are employed in stressful jobs, for example. And uh, so that was one of the, the earlier books that I wrote, it was a kind of self-help guide to how people can learn to build the resilience based on what the research shows us about how resilience works. Yeah, correct. And uh, your fifth book, which is uh, Teach Yourself Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, which came out in 2013. So you I know you've sort of blended stoicism with, with happiness. Can you can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Um, so I was asked to write a, a self help book um, for a Teach Yourself series, similar to the Resilience book about about uh, focus just on stoicism. And people keep asking. Stoicism is a big, complicated philosophy. So these people wanted a really simple, practical guide to how to actually employ stoic techniques in daily life. So that's what I wrote. It's kind of like a, a painted by numbers approach to how people can actually use contemplative or meditation exercises that are found in or closely based on the ancient stoic literature and how that can help them in daily life. And I know you're a big proponent on e-learning and courses as well. Um, Which sort of programs have you created? I know you've got a couple. Well, I mean, for many years, by accident, I got involved in e-learning fairly early on. Actually, I did a research project for for DEFRA for the Department of the Environment in the UK and the Health Service in the UK on cognitive behavioural therapy for stress management, um, which we did via e-learning. And so that got me using e-learning with my students, a trained psychotherapist for many years. Life coaches are trained for about 15 years in the UK, I ran a training school. And then I I have e-learning courses now, um, a bunch of them. Like we do a big one through a non-profit uh, called Modern Stoicism that I'm part of. It's run by a multidisciplinary team of volunteers, academics, classicists, philosophers, psychologists. So we do a thing called Stoic Week that I reckon about 20,000 people have done so far. We've got loads of research data from it and we've got other courses. But I have my own e-learning courses on uh, Marcus Aurelius and one on Socrates, uh, which people can do and it teaches them how to teaches them all about the philosophy that these guys employed and a bit more importantly how they can derive techniques from it that help them to cope with stress and improve their well-being and daily life yeah absolutely you, you've you've done a, a great body of work so i just want to say you know thank you for your research and and putting all the stuff out there you've written many articles online professional journals so uh you're a bit of heavyweight in, in that particular area so congratulations and thanks for all the work um which came first, cognitive behaviour therapy, trainer for you, or writer? Which, where did it all start? Um... You know, honestly, when I was a kid in school, uh, I misbehaved. I was quite naughty and I misbehaved all the time. And the only thing I was really good at was writing stories. And so when I was a wee boy, I thought, I'm going to be a writer when I grow up. And then for some reason, I kind of lost interest in it. And I just stumbled into writing books. And so it wasn't really kind of something that I planned to do later in life. But as a became a psychotherapist and I became a trainer of and supervisor of psychotherapists. That kind of involved a lot of writing. I had to write training manuals and design courses and stuff like that. And I spoke at conferences, so I had to write presentations. And I wanted to read a book um, about uh, philosophy and cognitive behavioural therapy that explained the connection between stoicism and modern uh, psychotherapy. But that book didn't exist. And so I simply thought, well, I guess I could write it 
I, and that got me stumbled into writing my first book. And then after that, it was too late to turn back, Michael. Like, I was, uh, you know, writing more and more books. And kind of once you reach a certain point as a writer, people start. You go from banging on publishers' doors, like trying to get a book deal, to people hassling you to write books. And so uh, I'm at that point now that uh, I'm booked up to with um, contracts to write books for the next five years or something like that. Um, so you know, I have I, uh, I kind of get asked to write a lot of stuff now. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up doing it, and I'm glad I enjoy writing. Um, but it, it it happened kind of accidentally in a way. Yeah, got it. And I know you've got a graphic uh, a graphic novel coming out soon. Uh, is that the first you, you've ever done? Yeah, yeah, a, a forthcoming graphic. Yeah, a, sorry, a forthcoming graphic novel. Um, what, what's it about? Um, and about his life and about Stoic philosophy. Um, it, people don't think we know. I mean, Marcus Aurelius is the author of one of the best loved, most widely read self-help spiritual classics of all time, The Meditations. Um, millions of people have read it and many, many translations of it. But people often assume that we don't really know that much about him, which is wrong. We actually know more about him than we do about virtually any other ancient philosopher because he was what I like to describe as a big deal back in the day. Like He was a Roman emperor at the height of his power. So we have three major surviving Roman histories of his reign with a bunch of archaeological evidence. Elefcina, where I'm going to on Friday, there's a bust of Marcus Aurelius. Um, that's left over from when he reconstructed, the, he revisited Elysina and reconstructed the temple there. So we can actually see archae- some archaeological evidence and um, virtually reach out and touch it. So we know a lot about this guy and I thought, well, we should do a graphic novel about him. Again, I kind of stumbled into that. I'm not an expert on comics or graphic novels, um, but the opportunity came up and I, I, just, I met by accident an illustrator who was experienced in this area and wanted to it, a guy called Zen Nuno Fraga in Portugal, he's an award-winning illustrator, and uh, I got into doing that and then I suddenly realised writing a graphic novel is a major undertaking and it's taken us a couple of years, two or three years, I think, all together to do this. It's like do, doing a movie or something. So it's 260 pages now of full-colour art that's, uh, we have a whole team of people working on it. And normally as a writer I work alone. But uh, when you do a graphic novel, you, you maybe have someone that drafts the images, colours them, does lettering, um, several editors. Like, we have a guy that we work with in Poland who checks the historical authenticity of the uniforms of the legionaries, the battle formation and the weapons that they're using everything to make sure it's historically accurate. So it's like a whole kind of factory, uh, a team of people producing it. Um, bigger deal like, than I'm used to writing prose books. Yeah, wow. And um, why is Marcus Aurelius one of the most famous Roman empires? Is it because he left over his journals, which got turned into meditations? But Well, because he wrote a book and it was like, uh, it's very, been very influential throughout the, the recent centuries. And also because he's in the movie Gladiator uh, with Russell Crowe, which is a bit of a dated reference now, but when that came out, in the first act of the movie, Richard Harris plays Marcus Aurelius. So loads of people got interested in him and went out, you know, whatever it was, 20 years ago now, and, and bought the book. And uh, so that gave him a big boost in his popularity. He's the last famous Stoic philosopher of antiquity as well. So he kind of represents uh, a lot of what we know about the Stoic philosophical tradition, which there's a burgeoning interest in at the moment because Stoic philosophy happens to be connected with cognitive behavioural therapy. Yep, yep. And I'll, it's a good segue to talk about uh, your most famous book to date, uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Uh, absolutely amazing. I've done a summary on my site for my audience. So uh, fantastic. I, I do encourage people to go out and buy the book and read it. It's uh, it's great. And I think one of the, the things that Marcus talks about is sort of building resilience with, um, you know, philosophical doctrines and therapeutic practices he talks about building the resilience do you want to touch yeah, on that yeah i'd be surprised i mean that's the i've written a bunch of books but that was the that one's a different ball game because it was suddenly much more popular it was number one best-selling book on philosophy for a couple of weeks when it came out in in the u.s and it's been translated into 15 different languages um so like uh, recently I was talking to the Japanese translators and they were telling me that stoicism, I thought stoicism wasn't that big in Japan but apparently I'm wrong and stoicism is trendy in Japan at the moment 
I have no idea. Like, so yeah, like it's it, it kind of exploded a bit, and uh, that uh, book. Um, I wanted to, I was asked by a publisher to write an introduction to Stoicism from a practical point of view. And I thought, I've already written one of those, and most of other people are writing them. So um, when I'm kind of mulling something over and I can't make my mind up, I think maybe there's a way of doing this where I can say yes and no. So I said yes. They said, I said yes and no. Like, um, I will write an introduction to Stoicism, but I'm not going to write it in the way that you expect. I'm going to write it by focusing on the life of a famous Stoic philosopher. So I think that's a, another good way, a better way of learning the basics of the subject is by looking at a living historical example. And I thought, geez, if only there was like some famous dude like, that we knew quite a lot about who did Stoicism and that people were interested in. So I thought about this for about five seconds. And then I went, oh yeah, Marcus Aurelius. And uh, so that was pretty clear that he should be the person that I write about. And, um, you know, and I thought we should call it How to Think of the Roman Emperor because whenever I told people that's what I wanted to call my book, they told me they thought that was a really stupid title for a book. And I thought, great, so everyone's going to remember it. Because like, it is a kind of stupid title for a book. Like, it makes them think, well, which Roman Emperor are you talking about? And luckily that's explained in the subtitle and his picture is in the front of it, so it's not too ambiguous. But it, it's got this kind of weird title that I thought would get people thinking. What does it mean to think like a Roman emperor? How can we think like a Roman emperor? Well, Marcus actually gave us a whole uh, uh, illustration of that in the meditations. He tells us exactly how he thinks. He records all of his thoughts verbatim in this book. He gives us a guide to exactly how he thought. Why would we want to think like a Roman emperor? Because this guy uh, took Stoic philosophy and applied it to a really tough life that he was living. He lived through the Antonine Plague, which was worse than the current pandemic. Um, how is it worse? Because uh, it was a variation of smallpox, which had a much higher fatality rate. Uh, the Romans had no idea how to deal with it, except to pray to the gods. And it went on for a really long time. It went on for like about 15 years or something like that, and it killed uh, and a lot of people in ancient Rome. So Mark has lived through something similar to the current pandemic, an ancient pandemic, but that was actually far scarier and far more severe. So we can see the meditations, in a sense, as a psychological and philosophical manual for coping with the stress of a pandemic, funnily enough. And that's partly why it's popular again today. I wrote an article about that for the Guardian newspaper, and it went kind of viral on the internet. It was shared by like uh, 12,000 people on Facebook when it came out. So um, Marcus tells us how Stoicism helps him to cope with these situations. And there are, in the first book I wrote on the subject, I tried to list all the psychological techniques that are in Stoicism and I identified about 18. So I'm not going to go through all of those with you right now. It's too many. But f to pick one, uh, one of the most famous Stoic techniques we call, modern scholars call the view from above. And it consists in picturing events as if you were viewing them from high above and expanding your perspective very carefully, both spatially and chronologically, um, so that you're broadening the context within which you perceive things. And as an evidence-based psychotherapist, this is fascinating to me. Modern psychologists now are all over this, doing research on it. There's a psychologist in Toronto uh, called uh, for Professor Vervaki carrying out cognitive research on this technique. Um, because one thing we know from modern research on psychopathology is that when people become distressed, they normally narrow down their scope of attention and the thinking becomes more selective. So doing the opposite of that and expanding your scope of attention should help us build resilience and moderate or dilute intense negative emotions. So he was right yeah. about that. Yeah, and Epictetus said uh, men aren't disturbed by... So men aren't disturbed by things, but by the views of which they take them. Um, which came first, Epictetus or, or Marcus Aurelius? Marcus Aurelius is slightly obsessed with Epictetus. He quotes him more often than he does any other philosopher. He sees himself, I think, as a, I think it's pretty clear he sees himself as a kind of disciple of Epictetus, but he'd never met him. Epictetus died in Greece um, when Marcus was about 12 or 13 years old in Rome and probably it's almost certain that they'd never met. However, Marcus met loads of other Stoic philosophers who were men a generation older, who were his teachers, 
many of whom had probably studied under um, or attended lectures by Epictetus. So he's one step removed from Epictetus and seems to consider himself a student of that branch of Stoicism. It would uh, be fantastic if we could uh, take the time machine back and, and spend some time uh, back when those uh, Stoic uh, giants were around and, and sort of learn from them in the, um, in the environment that they were teaching. That would be a, a great little thing. And one of the little things that the, the top three things with Stoic philosophy is, is living in accord with, with virtue. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? So the Stoics use this word arete, um, which we translate as virtue, which is a little bit of a kind of, um, uh, it's not an ideal translation, it kind of like sounds, this, nowadays when people say virtue, they have a kind of stuffy idea in a way about what that means. It's shaped in part by sort of Victorian values and uh, Christ, uh, Christian interpretation of virtue and stuff. So what the ancient Greeks meant by virtue was kind of a little bit different. And I think actually a better translation that would get more the gist of what they were talking about would be just to say that arity is a type of moral wisdom because really for the Stoics it's cognitive, it's intellectual, it's a form of understanding. Um, it's about grasping what's important and what's not important and the difference between what's good or helpful and what's bad or harmful in life and really seeing that very clearly. So arity is a form of moral wisdom. The Stoics think that humans are inherently rational, or at least that our highest nature is reason. Reason potentially guides everything else we do. It potentially allows us to evaluate our instincts and override them in some situations. And so they think that to really fulfill our potential, we should be living more consistently in accord with reason. This is very typical of Greek philosophy in general. It's no big shock there. I think Greek philosophers typically thought this way. They idolised uh, reason. And uh, the Stoics thought if we live consistently in accord with reason, we would be living wisely and we would be living virtuously uh, in our social interactions as well. So they, it's very much tied up with the, the ancient Greek philosophical conception of reason and what it would mean to live a rational uh, life and a consistent life in accord with our core values and again part of that reason it kind of overlaps with our dovetails with the ideals of modern cognitive psychotherapy yeah and they talk a lot about living a, a wise and, and virtuous life is is living in harmony with nature um a, admitting fate as it is and and you know whether it is ought to be or or, or might be uh, it's all about living harmony with yeah, nature and not complaining about stuff as much like they, they, that's the kind of simplified version. Sometimes Epictetus just tells his students, at one point he says, do not say alas, uh, or like, don't complain about stuff quite as much if you're a stoic. You need to learn to be more resigned emotionally to your fate. But stoicism doesn't preach passivity. On the contrary, it preaches uh, self-discipline, courage, and determination. The stoics were famous actually for standing up to, often risking and sometimes losing their lives defying political tyrants and dictators. Um, so the Stoics think we should be emotionally accepting or unperturbed in the face of misfortune or adversity, but reconcile that with a commitment to vigorous action and, and courageous action in the service of wisdom and justice. So they wanted us to kind of combine these two things that seem at odds in a way. How can we be active in the world and courageous and engaged while accepting setbacks and not being uh, freaked out by them yeah and um, one of the, the key tenets of stoicism is not to waste your time running around uh, looking for pleasures in life because it's only going to make you sad you know that's barely virtuous living um yeah um so yeah and another chapter from your book you talk about you know forming a connection with virtue offers you a consistent behavioral compass on which to depend on regardless of what life throws at you um, I, I'm a I'm a stoic myself. I do have some stoic philosophies in me, but it's not all about stiff upper lip. It is also about showing passion and and emotion as well. A lot of people get confused that being a stoic, you you must have a stiff upper lip, but um, it, it's more living in tune with nature and and showing your passions and emotions at the correct time. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I I mean this shocks a lot of people, but. It, it... You know, I would say that Stoicism, in a sense, is very much a philosophy of love. I think that's been obscured. For example, at the beginning of the meditations, Marcus describes one of his Stoic teachers, and he says that this guy embodies the Stoic ideal, which he describes as being free from 
passions, by which the Stoics mean irrational, excessive, and unhealthy passions. Same as we would talk about. Um, oh, the the in the sense that um, our word psychopathology is derived from their word pathos. So their word pathos means both passion and also suffering. And uh, really what they're talking about, therefore, are pathological or unhealthy emotions. So he says the Stoic ideal exemplified by this teacher is to be free from these pathological or unhealthy emotions and yet full of something that he calls in Greek philostorgia, which means love or kind of brotherly love. It's often translated as natural affection. Um, so to be free from unhealthy passions and yet full of this kind of rational love for life, for mankind, and the love of wisdom as well, which is really the uh, defining feature of, of Greek philosophy. It's what the word philosophy means, actually. But if we say it's about love, the way I say it to people, it's hidden in broad daylight, right, right under our nose. The clue's in the name, because the word philosophy itself uh, in Greek, which the Stoics spoke, literally means love of wisdom. And so they take that quite literally. You know, they We lose sight of that in the translation, but for them, it very, being a philosopher very much is about loving something. It's about loving and cherishing wisdom and also loving and admiring people that exhibit wisdom. Yep. And in chapter six in the book, you talk about make peace with, with physical pain. Was, was that a key tenet of Marcus Aurelius in Stoicism? Well, he was notoriously sickly. Uh, he had chest and stomach pain, sleep problems throughout his life. Um, he talks about dizziness and spitting blood. He our best guess is that he had maybe had a stomach ulcer or who knows, some other uh, health problems. Um, and we believe he died of the Antonine Plague, so we believe he died of a variation of smallpox. So he, he had a bunch of health problems throughout his life, like a lot of people in the ancient world. And so he talks often about coping with pain and physical discomfort by using techniques from Stoicism and other branches of ancient philosophy. And that's a, a thing that modern psychotherapists often help clients with is uh, chronic pain management or sometimes also acute pain if they have to go to the dentist or something. Um, my daughter, um, is uh, she's 10 now, um, but she was born at home. Uh, her mother didn't take even a, an aspirin, uh, nothing, uh, no gas and air, nothing. Like She just used um, similar techniques to the Stoics, cognitive behavioural techniques to cope with the, the pain and discomfort of childbirth. Um, so, like, uh, in many ways, in, in different areas, from childbirth to surgery to coping with chronic back pain, we, we use pain management strategies today that are prominent, predominantly cognitive behavioural, very similar to strategies that the Stoics used. Yeah, and you wrote about to, to relish the good things in life, sometimes we have to put ourselves through voluntary hardships. Uh, I think we all, all, everyone in life sometimes need to put themselves through some pain and some voluntary hardships. Uh, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, actually, you know, I can give you a very simple example of it, which is that if you want to improve your health, you probably go jogging or go to the gym and stuff like that, um, which for many people requires self-discipline and effort and endurance because it's kind of tiring running and doing exercise and sometimes you don't feel like doing it. So, you know, in, in a very familiar way, we often endure hardship or discomfort for our long-term health and well-being. But it also, the Stoics thought, not only helps us to lose weight and look good on the beach or whatever, but more importantly, they thought, it helps us to strengthen our character. So by doing exercise, for example, we become more self-disciplined, more self-aware, uh, we develop greater endurance, so we develop these character strengths, which are useful in other areas of life, by doing sports and by doing physical fitness exercises and stuff like that. Uh, we improve our character. And the Stoics thought that we can do that also by enduring other forms of difficulty and hardship. Um, so some people, when I was a young guy, I used to go camping a lot more. Like you, Some people might go hikes, uh, they might go camping in the wilderness and things like that. And again, by doing that, they develop self-discipline and endurance and strengthen their character. But modern Stoics will do things like take cold showers in the morning, they'll do intermittent fasting. Why, again, because they think these things in part are good for their health, but if you're stoic, uh, the idea is that even more important is the benefit that it has for your, your character um, and uh, you know, your, uh, these traits that we've talked about, which are directly related also to developing psychological resilience, 
in general across the board in life. Yeah, and I'm just going to have a quick segue. Um, you wrote about Marcus Aurelius talks about the value of mentorship and uh, as well as constructive criticism, bringing about better personal accountability. Uh, so I think in today's day and age, mentorship is, is quite big. Uh, touch on that a little bit um, with mentorship. Well, I'll tell you something, a bit trivia about that. I'm in the city of mentorship right now. Um, I'm in Athens, which is um, the patron goddess of Athens is Athena. And Athena is mentor. That's where the word comes from. So Athena used to disguise herself as other people. And in Homer's Odyssey, she disguises herself as a guy called Mentor. That's where we get the word mentoring from. It's a reference to the goddess Athena, actually. Um, it's a male name, but it refers to a woman. And because Athena was the goddess of wisdom, and her role in Greek mythology, to a large extent, was to give advice to Greek heroes such as Odysseus and to counsel them, encourage them and motivate them and coach them um, and tell them what to do basically. She would accompany them and give them advice. So this is where the idea of mentoring comes from. It's a direct reference to the role that the goddess Athena plays in Greek mythology. And the Stoics thought that mentoring was really important. Um, we've lost that in a way. We now think of Stoicism as a kind of bookish thing, but the Stoics Although they did write books and give lectures, they thought the best way to learn philosophy, the best way to learn Stoicism, was by hanging out with people who that are good role models. And, but they also recognised there's a problem with people that are good role models, which is that eventually they peg it, like, you know, because we're all mortal. So they thought, yeah, like the ideal would be if you could hang out with Socrates or hang out with Zeno and see you know, how, what they're like in the morning and what they're like uh, when they're eating the meals and when someone insults them, how they cope with that, right, and really learn from them in the flesh. Um, but of course, that's not always possible. Like, sometimes you might have to go somewhere else and there's not any mentors or role models around. You know, sometimes, eventually these guys die and we, you might be living in a country or in an era where there aren't many good role models for Stoicism around, in which case you have to use your imagination a little bit more, you study historical figures, or well, the Stoics would do this thing called the contemplation of the sage, where they carefully construct in their mind an image of what an ideal, wise and virtuous person would be like, and then ask themselves what that person would do in the situations that they're currently struggling with, so they have a kind of standard by which to measure their own behaviour. Um, and so the mentoring played an important role in learning ancient philosophy. You know, now we have therapists, life coaches, counsellors and stuff like that. It's kind of a little bit similar. But we have, it requires a bit more effort these days because we don't have uh, as many uh, figures like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus walking our, our streets these days. Yeah, what what is your take on on self help and and therapy? Do you think it's a good thing that we've got, you know, tens and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of, you know, life coaches and and self help gurus and and things like that? Do you think that's a positive thing? Yes and no. Uh, I yeah, like it's got positive, like in it, like many things in life, it's got positive and negative aspects to it. Um, I think there are probably too many life coaches, like in the world. Like I think we could, I think we could do with having a call. Like or purge and like get rid of some of them. I think one of the problems with life coaching, like certain other disciplines, like web design, for example, and digital marketing, is that there's no barrier to entry. So anybody and his dog can just print a business card and say, like he does this for a living. And so you meet a lot of the the, the market is saturated with unqualified life coaches, and like psychotherapy, yeah, you've met a few, a few like so like like. Yeah, it's like psychotherapy, people are often drawn to helping other people because really they want to help themselves. Um, and that can be a good thing. If you've had problems and obstacles and you've overcome them, then maybe you'd be in a good position to help other people. But I, you know, often therapists, counsellors and life coaches are people that still have problems that they're coping with in life. Um, and so, you know, maybe in some cases they'd be better off you know, making more progress first, like before helping. Other. I say that as someone who spent many years teaching life coaches and therapists. I often thought they needed more help than their clients did. Also, some of the most famous psychotherapists in history were more messed up than their clients. I quote uh, Ernest Jones, the psychiatrist, 
Welsh psychiatrist and the most famous biographer and friend of Sigmund Freud, uh, and Ernest Jones, who knew Freud very well and was a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst himself, said that Freud was, and I quote, the most neurotic man that he'd ever met in his life. So, you know, it's always been the case that psychotherapy and life coaching today have yeah. attracted people that are struggling with their own issues. And maybe there are too many, you know, you know maybe, maybe there should be more criteria for entry to the, to the field or something like that. But uh, I, uh, there are pros and cons. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I, I think you've done the right thing in over 25 years of research in the books and the articles and the journals and, and what you've actually done as a, as a body of work. Uh, congratulations. Um, I think we'll start wrapping up and I've got a little weird question for you, but I'm interested in your answer. So um, if you know the TV sh- if you know the TV show Come Dine With Me in the UK, uh, if you could have a dinner party with three people from history, I pretty much know one person you're going to invite, Marcus Aurelius, but um, who would they be and what would you serve them? Uh, well, I can, I have three, come down with me. I think I've seen a little bit. I don't really watch much TV. But uh, Marcus Aurelius, I guess, I'd invite, I think. Actually, he's funnily enough, I don't think he's the most interesting figure in, in history. He's I, I kind of love Marcus Aurelius. I'm fascinated by him. I spent many years studying him. But he's a little bit of a one-dimensional character, I have to say. Um, Socrates, however, is one of the most captivating uh, fascinating, multifaceted figures in history. He's a whole different ball game. They have a great deal in common. They believe very similar things. But Marcus, you get a kind of bullet point version of it, whereas Socrates, you get this kind of like three-dimensional chess, you know, version of it. Like Socrates, on every level, is a far more complex, charismatic, and fascinating uh, figure. I, I have to say. Than Marcus Aurelius, and these are two individuals that I spent a lot of time studying. So he, he I definitely, I'd want to meet Socrates, and then um, another individual, I guess, like just because I'm curious to see what he'd be like in the flesh. I, I'd probably want to meet Epictetus. I'd imagine he would be like somewhere in between Marcus and, and Socrates. He'd, he'd be he'd be a kind of combination of the two. So that's the three: Marcus Aurelius, Socrates, and Epictetus. And, uh, and what would you serve them? Would you? What would I serve them? Um, well, there's two possible answers to that. Um, th- one, I, I'd either serve them a traditional Stoic cynic meal, um, which would be, you know, lentil soup, like that's uh, our lupin seeds, which is what the, the cynics and some kind of the more austere Stoics were, were known for living on. They had this very simple diet. Um, or, I guess just for kicks, maybe I'd serve them a really fancy ancient Roman meal. And actually we know of a f- notorious Roman dish, which Marcus Aurelius' uh, adoptive brother's father uh, allegedly invented. And it was very popular with the Emperor Hadrian, which is Marcus Aurelius' adoptive grandfather. And it's a meal which is named after a parody of Epicurean philosophy. So in Epicurean philosophy, we have this principle called the fourfold remedy. It's a philosophical doctrine. But this meal was called the fourfold remedy or the tetrapharmacon. And it consisted of pheasant and beef um, and pork and also uh, all wrapped in pastry uh, and also a Roman delicacy, uh, which is uh, braised sow's udder and vulva which the Romans ate some pretty uh, surprising things and apparently that was one of their favourite things to, to eat and that, as if it wasn't bad enough, was then wrapped together with all this other meat in a big pastry. Um, I, I personally, I believe it may have been one of the things that killed Adrian. So I'd, I'd, I'd put that to them as a kind of test, see how they cope with the tetrapharmacon. Yeah, got it, got it. And I forgot to ask you one question. Uh, I myself am a fellow Toastmaster, and so uh, I know you've, you've been involved in Toastmasters. Um, where did that start, and, and how did that improve your, your speaking career? Gosh, I don't know. I think my speaking career is irredeemable because I've been doing public speaking for such a long time. When I was a young guy, I had quite bad social anxiety, and like a lot of people, I decided to overcompensate for it by making myself... Do, uh, do a lot of public speaking pretty early on. And and then I, I did so much of it that I kind of got 
less disciplined and quite lazy about it and, and spoke off the cuff a lot more. So I did a few years back, four or five years ago I guess it was now, did my Toastmasters initial certification because I thought maybe I should try a bit harder to improve by partly kind of, you know, teaching an old dog new tricks kind of thing. I thought I should maybe try a bit harder. And I did, you know, I, I loved the experience of Toastmasters and I learned it. I think the main thing it taught me was I'm used to talking all day long. I used to uh, run courses that went on for like six or seven hours for seven days in a row. And Toastmasters taught me to be more concise and try and compress my ideas into five minutes. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And um, where can people find you online and where can they buy your books? Well, I mean, my website is donaldrobertson.name, N-A-M-E. And you can find all my social media and e-learning courses and everything there. Uh, I'm also one of the founding members of the Modern Stoicism organisation and its website is just modernstoicism.com and that's like one of the main hubs for information about stoicism. It's got free courses and hundreds and hundreds of articles and runs an annual conference, several conferences and stuff. And my books, you can just buy from Amazon or, oh, I shouldn't say, I get into trouble for saying that. You should, you could buy my books from independent bookstores uh, as well as Amazon and all booksellers actually. Um, but you can you can find them anywhere really, and in, and in many different how to think of the Roman Emperor, um, in many surprising languages. Um, even I'm very proud to say in Greek. Uh, so I'm very pleased for some reason uh, because I love Greece to see uh, the Greek translation of my book occasionally in bookshops here and in the airport. I saw it in sale in the Greek airport in Athens. Um, but yeah, but you can find my books anywhere online. Yeah, perfect. And what's the last message you want to leave our audience and people listening? Oh, uh, like, actually, one of my favourite quotes from uh, from Horace, the Roman poet who was influenced by Stoic philosophy, uh, and that is, dare to be wise. I think that's only two words, but uh, I think it's a very important point. Like, make a conscious effort to exercise reason consistently in daily life, because it's within your power to do so if only you have that aspiration so only two words but actually you know an important meaningful profound message dare to be wise perfect and uh i thank you for your time and thank you for being on the uh, best book bits podcast donald it's been a pleasure and i uh, look forward to many more books from you in the future so thanks for your time and uh, have a great day thanks very much no worries thanks